Chapter 3 Timbabati Bertie was born in South Africa in a remote farmhouse near a place called Timbabati. It was shortly after Bertie first started to walk that his mother and father decided a fence must be put around the farmhouse to make a compound where Bertie could play in safety. It wouldn't keep the snakes out, nothing could do that. But at least Bertie would be safe now from the leopards and the lions and the spotted hyenas. Enclosed within the compound were the lawn and the gardens at the front of the house and the stables and barns at the back. All the room a child would need, or want, you might think, but not Bertie. The farm stretched as far as the eye could see, in all directions. 20,000 acres of veld. Bertie's father farmed cattle, but times were hard. The rains had failed too often, and many of the rivers and waterholes had all but dried up. With fewer wildebeest and impala to prey on, the lions and leopards would sneak upon the cattle whenever they could. So Bertie's father was more often than not away from home with his men, guarding the cattle. Every time he left, he'd say the same thing. Don't you ever open that gate, Bertie. You hear me? There's lions out there, leopards, elephants, hyenas. You stay put, you hear? Bertie would stand at the fence and watch him ride out, and he would be left behind with his mother. He was also his teacher. There were no schools for a hundred miles, and his mother, too, was always warning him to stay inside the fence. Look what happened in Peter and the Wolf, she would say. His mother was often sick with malaria, and even when she wasn't sick, she would be listless and sad. There were good days, days when she would play the piano for him and play hide and seek around the compound, or he'd sit on her lap on the sofa out on the veranda and she'd just talk and talk all about her home in England, about how much she hated the wildness and loneliness of Africa, and about how Bertie was everything to her. But they were rare days. Every morning he'd climb into her bed and snuggle up to her, hoping against hope that today she'd be well and happy. But so often she wasn't, and Bertie would be left on his own again, to his own devices. There was a waterhole downhill from the farmhouse, and some distance away. That waterhole, when there was water in it, became Bertie's whole world. He would spend hours in the dusty compound, his hands gripping the fence, looking out at the wonders of the bell, at the giraffes drinking, spread light at the waterhole, at the browsing in parlour, tails twitching, alert, at the warthog snorting and snuffling under the shade of the Shanghai trees. At the baboons, the zebras, the wildebeests and the elephants bathing in the mud. But the, boat, the moment Bertie always longed for was when a pride of lions came padding out of the bell. The impala were the first to spring away. Then the zebra would panic and gallop off. Within seconds, the lions would have the water hole to themselves and they would crouch to drink. From the safe haven of the compound, Bertie looked and leaned looked and learned as he grew up. By now he could climb the tree by the farmhouse and sit high in its branches. He could see better from up there. He would wait for his lions for hours on end. He got to know the life of the waterhole so well that he could feel the lions were out there even before he saw them. Bertie had no friends to play with, but he always said he was never lonely as a child. At night he loved reading his books and losing himself in the stories, and by day his heart was out on the veil with the animals. That was where he yearned to be. Whenever his mother was well enough, he would beg her to take him outside the compound. But her answer was always the same. I can't, Bertie. Your father has been forbidden it, she said. And that was that.